you can certain certain animals that go through larval stages, right? So you can take so what the, the Russians were using um, beetle beetle larvae, and uh, and Doug and other people used uh, used used uh, moths and butterflies. So what happens is you train you train the larva. Right. So 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 here you've got a butter a, a caterpillar. So so this caterpillar lives in a two dimensional world. It's a soft bodied robot. It lives in a two dimensional world It eats leaves and so on. Right. And so you train this thing for a particular task. Well, during metamorphosis, it needs to become a moth or butterfly, which it lives in a three dimensional world. Plus, it's a hard bodied creature. So so the controller is completely different. Right. For running this you know, for running a caterpillar versus a butterfly. So so during that process, what happens is the brain is basically dissolved. So most of the connections are broken. Most of the cells are gone. They die. Uh, you you put together a brand new brain. It self assembles, and you can ask all sorts of interesting philosophical questions of what it's like to be a creature whose brain is undergoing this massive change. Uh, but the information remains, and so one can ask, okay, this is you know certainly for computer science, it's it's it's, it's amazing to have a com to have a to have a, a, a memory medium that can survive this radical re re remodeling and reconstruction, and. There's there's the RNA story, but but also um, uh, you had mentioned you know does this does this work for for mammals? So there was a guy in the 70s and 80s. There was a there was a guy named George Ungar who did tons of he's got tons of papers. He uh, reproduced it in rats. So so his was fear of the dark, and he actually um, by 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 establishing this assay and then um, uh, you know fractionating their brains and 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 extracting this this uh, activity now he thought it was a peptide not not rna so he he ended up with a with a thing called uh, scotophobin which turns out to be i think an 8 mer peptide or something and the claim was that you can transfer this scotophobin you can synthesize it uh, and then transfer it from brain to brain and and that's and that's you know that's 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 what he thought it was and then of course i think david glansman favors rna again but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I think that's a that's a that's a super important story of how it is that this kind of information can survive uh, just just massive uh, remodeling of the of the cognitive substrate in planaria. What we what we did and and planaria, you know, they they have a true centralized brain. They have all, all the same neurotransmitters that we have. They're not a simple a simple organism. Um, what we did was McConnell's first experiments, which is to train them on something, and we train them to recognize a uh, laser etched um, kind of bumpy pattern on the bottom of the dish and to recognize that that's where their food was going to be found. So they made this association between this pattern and, the, and, the, and getting food. And then we cut their heads off and, and we took the tails and the tails sit there for 10 days doing nothing. And then eventually they grow a new brain. And what happens is that information is then imprinted onto the new brain. And then, and then you can recover behavioral you know, uh, evidence that they remember the information. So, so that's pretty cool too, because it suggests that well, we we don't know if the information is everywhere or if it's in other places in the peripheral nervous system or in the you know in the nerve core that we we don't know where it is yet, but it's clear that it can move around that the information can move around in the body because it can be in the posterior half and then imprinted onto the brain, which actually drives all the all the behaviors. And so thinking about that, I, I totally agree with that. This is this is a really important rabbit hole for asking. But but it has it, there's an interesting puzzle here, which which is which is this. You know, it's one thing to remember things that are e evolutionarily uh, adaptive, like fear of the dark and things like this. But imagine, and this hasn't really been done well. But imagine for a moment if we could train them to something that is completely novel. Let's say let's say we train them. Um, uh, three yellow light flashes means uh, take a step to your left. Otherwise, you get shocked. Something like that. And let's say they learn to do it. We haven't done this yet, but let's say let's say this could be could work. One of the big uh, puzzles is going to be when you extract whatever it is that you extract. Uh, let's say it's RNA or protein, whatever it is. You stick it into the brain of a recipient host, and in order for that memory to transfer, one of the things that the host has to be able to do is it has to be able to decode it. And in order to decode it. It's one thing if we share the same code book, and by evolution, we could have the same code book for things that come up all the time, like fear of the dark, fear, you know, things like that. But how do you how how would the recipient look at a a a, a weird sort of you know some some kind of crazy hairpin RNA structure and look at and and, and analyze it and be like, oh yes, that's three light flashes, mm -hmm. and then uh, ah step to the left, I see. So you would need to be able to interpret somehow this this structure and convert it back to the behavior and for and for behaviors that are truly arbitrary that might be I, I don't know actually how that would work and so so I think the frontier of this field is going to be to have a really uh convincing demonstration of, of a transfer of a memory that 
doesn't have a plausible pre-existing shared evolutionary decoding because because otherwise you have a you have a real puzzle as to how the as to how the the decoding is going to work. So this this idea and and then and then even without the transfer you can also think of it a different way. Every memory is like a message is like basically a transplanted message from your past self to your future self, meaning that you still have to decode your memories. Whatever your memories are in an important sense, you have to, you know, those engrams, you have to decode them somehow. So um, that that whole issue of, of, of encoding and decoding, whatever the substrate of memory is, is, you know, maybe one of the most important questions there are. You just watched a clip from the Theories of Everything channel. For the full video and all its magnificence, then click here. And if you'd like to see more, then subscribe. Enjoy.